theme in these psalms. It is like this mounting crescendo that we've talked about at the climax of this great symphony. The theme of praise has dominated all of the psalms, but as the end of the book approaches, the conductor brings in each section of the orchestra, if you will, to one great finale of praise. Psalm 150 is the climax of the climax where we are extorted 13 times in six short verses to praise the Lord. And it is telling us that God's people should be caught up in praising him. And I wonder how many of us in life can say, praising God characterizes my life. The extent to which we cannot say that reflects to the extent to which we're not God-centered. We are not to be praise-centered, but God-centered. And a God-centered person will be the center of praise. As God's people, we should focus on him in every situation and therefore be people of praise. Now, to break Psalm 150 down, it gives us the where, the why, the how, and the who of praise. It doesn't give us the per se of what. So just for clear about this, we are praise, we're talking about praising God. We're not talking about repeating praise the Lord over and over and over again. We're talking about thinking or speaking well of God's attributes and his great acts. Praise can be expressed through singing, as we talked about with the children's sermon, or music, clapping your hands, raising your hands or your arms. Um, through testimony or thanksgiving, prayer, sacrificial service, and giving. If we want to praise to characterize our lives, the psalmist would have us understand some things. So the first verse of Psalm 150 is the where of praise. Everywhere. Everywhere. God's sanctuary refers to the place of worship on earth where God's people are gathered. It could be in this church, it could be in the parking lot, we're gathered, this is his sanctuary of his people together. In the psalmist's day, it was the temple of Jerusalem. In ours, it is our church. Um, the mighty expanse refers to the heavens, and this is a call to all of the heavenly hosts to praise God. Thus the psalmist is saying, praise God everywhere, praise him on earth, Praise him in the heavens. Derek Kinder writes, God's glory fills the universe. His praise much, must do no less. Um, the word sanctuary refers especially to corporate gatherings of God's people. And it means that the praise of God should be our main business as we gather in the church. We should not gather primarily to meet with our friends, although that's an aspect of our meetings. We shouldn't gather primarily to win the lost, although we pray that many without Christ will be brought to repentance. We should not come primarily to have our needs met, although that often will happen. We gather primarily to meet with God, to corporately offer praise to him, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. It is Dr. Olson's in my objective every week through the preaching of God's word that each one present here will encounter God. Our corporate worship will be enhanced if each member has been praising God wherever they are during the week. And each of us should begin our day by focusing our thoughts on God, on who he is and what he has graciously done for us. If we want praise to characterize our lives, the psalmist would also have us understand the second verse of Psalm 150 is the why. Every act and attribute of God. Why should we praise God? Two reasons. Because what he's, what he's done, his mighty deeds, and because of who he is, his excellent greatness. So I thought it was fitting we look back on Psalms and remind you of the great things that he's done. This all comes from Psalms. Well, Psalms 139, he formed you while you were in the womb and ordained you all the days of your life. 
Psalm 22, he sent the Messiah to die for our sins. Psalm 23 shows us his providing for our every need as our great shepherd. Psalm 32 tells us of the forgiveness of sin to which God gives the repentant sinner. Psalm 57 taught us how God is sufficient in a time of trial. 71 taught us of God's grace for old age. Psalm 119 extols God's word to which he graciously given to guide us. Truly God has done some mighty, mighty deeds. Think of how God has dealt with you. He chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world. He sought you when you were dead in your own transgressions and sins. When you were still even hostile towards him, he still picked you. He caused you to be born again in living hope. He has graciously dealt and patiently with you to lead the place where you are today. And it's he who began this good work in you that will perfect it until the day that Jesus Christ comes. We should also praise God for his excellent greatness. Apart from his many great deeds, God is worthy of praise simply for who he is. He is perfect and lacks nothing. He is the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God. He is blessed only by the sovereign, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone possesses immorality and dwells in unapproachable light. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will they existed and they were created. Praise God according to his excellent greatness. We also must understand the third through the fifth verse of Psalm 150 is the how. You do it with everything you've got. The sense of these verses is pull up your bootstraps and give it everything you have. Use your breath to blow in a trumpet. Play the harp. Use your fingers. Use your whole hand to hit the tambourine. Move your body to the dance. There are stringed instruments and wind instruments and percussion instruments, and it sounds more like a Disneyland parade than a Sunday morning worship service, right? But maybe somehow, sometime, we've picked up the wrong idea about worship. Russian author Dus Toskowski has the devil say in the brothers Kamarath, everything would be transformed into a religious service. It would be holy, but a little dull. Isn't that often our concept of worship, that it's holy but a little dull? Verses 3 through 5 describe two indispensable elements of worship. Festivity. There is a festive joy in these verses. Worship should not be this somber, formal exercise. Yes, you need to be reverent. We're reverent. We, we traditional worship service as in the fitting of the presence of Almighty God. But of course there's a place for somberness too. But when we confess our sins and we think on the Lord's sacrificial death, but God also wants his people to celebrate his goodness. We are not at God's funeral. We serve a risen Savior. Our faces should reflect that we are enjoying God and his bountiful provision for us in Jesus Christ. I read of a man who came to Christ from a non-religious background, so he didn't know the Christian politically correct jargon. And when he was baptized, he came up out of the water, clapping his hands for joy, shouting, hot dog, hot dog. He was excited about God or the little boy on Facebook that you see the video. He's probably seven, eight, nine years old, and he's in the baptistry, and the, and the preacher is saying all these things, and he's so excited, and he's jumping for joy, and he dunks himself. <laughs> and he stands up. I can't wait any longer. 
And on Wednesday nights, those of you who come Wednesday nights, Miss Lily is not here today, but she reads our scriptures when I teach. And I love, love, love when she does that because she gets her Bible open. And I say, Lily, read verses 1 through 3, and then we're going to talk about it. And she reads 1 through 10, and she just gets going. And she's so excited about what she's reading. She's just embracing and embodying the Spirit of Christ. How do you tell them to stop? You know, I just let her keep reading. <laughs> and at this point, you may be saying, now, wait a minute. That, that's not my personality. I'm a quiet and reserved human being, right? Really? Are there any Redskins fan out there? <laughs> Raise your hand if you're a Redskins fan. What about a Dallas Cowboy fan? Any Dallas? I had to call my brother to remember this game, and I do remember watching this, but the thrill game in 2005, when Dallas played the Redskins at Dallas, and let me refresh your memory. It was a comeback story of a lifetime. This Monday night at Texas Stadium, these longtime division rivals were playing each other, and it lacked a lot of excitement for most of the evening, as most Redskins football games do. Sorry. Where's Dan? Sorry. And then suddenly a snoozer of the game between the Washington Redskins and the Dallas Cowboys turned into this thriller. And the Cowboys owned a 13-0 advantage after tacking on a field goal with less than six minutes to play. And the next two times the Redskins had the ball, quarterback Mark Brunel found wide receiver Santana Moss for scores of 39 and then 70-yard touchdowns. A stunned Cowboys would fall at home and lose 14-13. Now, for Redskins fans in here, how quiet and reserved would you be at that moment? <laughs> You're at Buffalo Wild Wings. Would anybody be quiet and reserved in that moment? No. You see, we all have things that get us excited. And we just happen to get excited about the trivial instead of the crucial. To stick with the football analogy for a minute, praise is a natural response to a tremendous play. And when you see a spectacular play, it's not only natural, but only necessary to fully enjoy the game. You have to stand up and shout and say, yes, did you see that catch? You want to share the excitement with somebody else who loves the game. Praise is a natural and necessary response to fully appreciate the object being praised, and it needs to be expressed. But, like in my house, what happens if your wife doesn't fully appreciate the game? <laughs> my boys shout, I live with four boys, I'm completely outnumbered. And they say, did you see that play? And I say, what is the big deal? I mean... <laughs> Who cares? Anyway, it's a game. And they think to themselves, well, she really doesn't love the game because I don't get up and cheer. Oh, well. If you love the game, you're going to get excited about it. If you love the Lord, you're going to get excited about gathering with his people in his name. If you come to church with no preparation, hassled by some problem, glancing constantly at your watch and thinking, let's get this show over with so I can get on with the daily day activities. You will never praise God as you should. And the second element to worship is fervency. You, all, you have to all be there. All of you has to be there. You must focus your mind on God. You must concentrate on the significance of the songs and the words of the scripture. You have to shape shake off the apathy and worship as a soul-killing sin. You must make praise your priority and dedicate your whole being to the process. When the billionaire Howard Hughes died, a corporate relations director of his Summa Corporation asked the casinos in Las Vegas, Nevada, where Hughes had vast holdings. For a moment of silence out of respect, for Hughes. 
The message went out over the public address systems and the noisy, normally casinos fell silent. Housewives stood uncomfortably clutching their paper cups of coins at the slot machines and the blackjack games paused and the, the crap tables stickmen cradled the dice in the crooks of their wooden wands. And then the pit boss looked at his watch, leaned forward and whispered to the stickman. He said, okay, roll the dice. He's had his minute. That's some respect, huh? Yet I can't help wondering if that's not the way we often view worship. Let's give God our hour, 11 to 12. We're going to give God his time. So we can get on the things that we would rather be doing. 12 o'clock, come on quick, I got to get to Lake Anna. Got lunch plans. We ought to come to church with the fervency and expectancy as if Jesus himself is going to be sitting right here. He is going to be preaching to you. He is present. He's here right now. He's here in everything that we sing and that we pray and that we speak. His presence is here right now. He deserves our giving him everything that we've got in worship. But the psalmist would not only have us understand the where and the why and the how of praise. He also wants us to grasp the sixth verse, the last verse of Psalm 150 is the who. And that is everything that breathes. The only qualification for praising God is that you breathe. And, and I hope, please, that that does not disqualify anyone in this room right now. Please turn to your sides and make sure everyone is breathing right now. <laughs> I think we've only, in the history of the church, Tommy Robinson said we've only had one taken out of here on a gurney. And that was in the past decade, if y'all remember. But that's the only qualification. The most striking feature of this psalm is the fact that in six short verses, we are commanded to praise God no less than 13 times. In Hebrew, the greatest number of words between any hallelujahs is four. And only once, and in, other, in every other instance, there are just two words between one hallelujah and the next. The third word is a command to praise God. The fact that God can command us to praise him means that praise is not just a feeling upon your mood or circumstance. Praise is part of a feeling, but not at its heart a feeling. Praise is a matter of our obedience to our great God. It stems from deliberately focusing on him. It is a result of being willfully God-centered in your thinking. So if you are breathing today, praising God is not an option. It is your responsibility. So to say all of this in the message of Psalm, and especially of Psalm 150 today, is that God's people should be caught up in praising him. And maybe you don't know how to do it. So I'd like to walk you through a life of praise looks like. First individually and then corporately. You get up Monday morning, and the first thing that pops into your mind is the pressures of the week. You stare at your alarm and wondering why in the world it went off 20 minutes earlier than it should have been. And then you remember, I want to be a person of praise. So you set your alarm so you could spend a few minutes with the Lord to start your day. And you open your Bible and you open to the Psalms or whatever other book you're reading. And you focus your thoughts on how great God is and what he has done for you. And you pray, Lord, you are the eternal God, the almighty creator. Thank you for loving me and saving me from my sins. Your mercies are fresh every morning. Great is your faithfulness. You ordain today for me, and even in the minor details that aren't going to go my way, you still formed me in my mother's womb. Your purpose is to shape me into the image of Jesus Christ. And now, Father, I have these problems. And as you cast your burdens upon the Lord then, Maybe he puts a song in your heart that you sing or hum for the rest of the day as you get ready. 
Do you see how praise puts things in perspective? And throughout the day, you pause to focus on hymns and you pray your problems that come up and you give thanks to God when you feel better. You are putting God at the center of your life now. So your life is becoming filled with praise. And then Sunday morning rolls around and you wake up and think, praise God, it's the Lord's day. I had the privilege of worshiping God with my church family and you get ready and you hurry to get here by 9.45 to go to Sunday school and to fellowship. And on the way, your family sings a song together or you remind your kids of the purpose by worshiping God. And as you enter, Jim is playing a hymn that you know and you think of the words or you look at the bulletin and you notice that I'm gonna preach on Psalm 150. And so you read it prayerfully before I start and ask God to help you focus in on him. The first hymn is announced and you stand and you sing the words, praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. And you sing it with such vigor because the words have such meaning to you. You don't allow yourself to be distracted by other things. Your focus is on the Lord. And as you continue to sing, you are drawn more and more into God's presence. You listen attentively and eagerly to God's word as it's preached and as the sermon is concluded. You ask God to help you obey as you yield yourself to him. You pray for others who may not know Christ or who may be resisting his leading this morning. You have met with God now and you have praised him with his people. You didn't come to get something out of the service. You came to worship and praise Almighty God. And as you leave, you realize how much you received because you made praise your priority. Not just on a Sunday and not just on a Monday morning, but throughout the week. You are a person whose life is becoming more and more centered on God, caught up with praising him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we hear you this morning that our main focus should be worship and honor and praising you. Allow us to heed these words and live our lives in accordance with your will. Amen. After each service, we do give a time of invitation. God spoke his words to us this morning. Let's answer him. Whether it's opening your heart to follow him for the rest of your life, the most important decision that you will ever make, or to become a member of this church congregation at Haymarket Baptist Church, I will be at the front to accept any and all who may come. Let us stand together and happily sing our hymn number 14, Praise the Lord the Almighty. Amen. Surely his good
goodness and mercy here daily attend thee. Ponder on you what the Almighty can do if with his love ye befriend thee. Praise to the Lord, O oh, let all that is in me adore him. All that had life and breath come now with praises before him. Let the Amen sound from his people again. Gladly for I we adore Contending as one man for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. It is a sign to them that when they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you give you peace. Amen. May the grace of Christ our Savior and the Father's boundless love